half of our double act, uh, which is Mark um, Edward. And so he is going to be talking to us about uh, psychic entertainment. And when I asked him for his quirky fact, um, he gave me two. One of which I don't, I, I, I share both of them with you, and I'm not sure it's really quirky. So one of which is he collects gargoyles. Um, that's cool. I used to collect gargoyles a And the other is that he collects Edward Gorey books. Ooh. And now that, yes, exactly. So if you don't know who Edward Gorey is, um, he was this incredible um, uh, writer and illustrator who used to write these beautiful, very macabre little books. Um, and uh, my favourite are the Gash and Crumb Tinies. Uh, one of my favourites. And the Gash and Crumb Tinies is, a, is a basically an alphabet of children's names and the ways they died. So A is for Amy, who, what was Amy? Say again? Fell down the stairs. Fell down the stairs. B is for Boris, devoured by bears. And so it goes on. So I really share that with you. They are beautiful little books. Yep. Um, and yeah, so, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Mark Edward, and I am a thought reader. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. <laughs> you're thinking there's no possible way in the world. Could we maybe, is this distracting you? Because if I'm going to be looking at your thoughts, I don't want you to be focused on this. We'll leave it up, we'll leave it up, it's okay, maybe it'll help me in the end. So I want you to know, I can't just pick out somebody in the audience and tell everyone else what that person is thinking. That would be a nightmare for me, okay? But if we work together as a team and back and forth, back and forth, we create this sort of synergy, amazing things can happen. So that's the premise that I work with. Uh, I'm gonna be looking at your thoughts but before I look at your thoughts, I'd like to try and send the thought out to you and see who is going to act on rapport with the medium. This is a really good way to just warm up the crowd. So when I told you that you were a thought reader, I was a thought reader, sometimes people tense up. So the first thing I want you to do is relax. You just had lunch. Yeah, I want to see the shoulders go down. I want, I want you to take a deep cleansing breath. Don't feel like you're on the spot or I'm going to embarrass you, unless it's something really funny and then what the hell. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't do that. So I'm going to send you a thought. Open your minds. I'm going to just give you some parameters. What I'd like everyone to do is think of a number between 0 and 50. Both of the digits are odd and both of the digits are different. Okay, so here we go, I'm gonna send it out. Okay, how many people immediately saw the number 37? Raise your hand. That's not that good. Well, this is a skeptic audience. 30, 35, somewhere over here, like right, this gentleman here. Interesting. Well. You know, that's because you are thinking audience, you're fighting against the psychic energies. <laughs> and that's all right. Because I don't mind. I like working with the skeptic audience because I've now given you something to think about. Uh, it's generally, how about 39 just for fun? A little better, okay? So it's got to be one of those, but anyway, you get the idea. So I'm going to try some experiments this afternoon, and then I'm going to give you my pitch about why Susan and I are here. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I have a sketch pad that I brought with me and I asked someone to work with me during the show. Okay, so I did what is technically called in mentalism pre-show. That means I did set something up with someone before the show started. Okay, and that's generally how a lot of these things are done. So I'm going to ask the lady who helped me out, your name was Trish, right? Trish, what she, let me explain what we did first. I gave Trish a sheet of paper from my pad, okay? And she put it on the front of the cardboard pad, and I gave her a felt-tip pen, and we stood out in the, the plaza out here, 
and I probably stood 50, 60 feet away from you, and I had my back turned, and I told Trish to think of two shapes, one inside the other, any two shapes that came to her mind. And she held up the pad like this, she put the pen straight on because a lot of times if people are like this, they think that I'm looking at the top. Oh, that would be cheating. Would I do that? No. Straight on. I walked away, turned my back to her. I said, on one, two, three, some of the people out there might have seen this going on and wondered, what the hell is he doing? Anyway, I said, one, two, three, go. She drew the picture. I told her to fold it in half, fold it in half again. So she's been holding on to the picture. You didn't show it to anybody, did you? Okay, we didn't, we didn't write it on paper so it bled through. You were right on the cover, right? So, would you all give this wonderful assistant of mine a hand as she joins me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, thought reading at its best can be described as entertainment, okay? And in the worst cases, it could be outright fraud. <laughs> so, so, if you would stand right here. This is Trish, ladies and gentlemen. Trish. So to start out, I'm going to ask you to take the piece of paper out of your pocket and I want you to uh, unfold it towards yourself like this, but keep your hands like this so no one can see through the paper that what the, 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 the uh, drawing will be towards you. Make sure no one can see what it is. You got it? <laughs> well, don't show it to anybody. I don't want to look at it. Have you got it? Okay, now come towards me like this back to back. Don't worry, we're going to have actual contact here. So important in the work I do. <laughs> oh, I got a very interesting thing. You have a... Oh, well, oh, never mind. We'll get to that later. Um, are you ready? Are you thinking of your picture? Yeah. Good, think of it. This is kind of a weird one. I did not know you were that creative. What month were you born in? No, I'm, I'm having a problem. <laughs> Around the 19th? Oh, man, this, this may not work, but I'm going to try it because risk is part of my job as well. So here we go. We're going to separate now. Oh, I know what I was getting. You have a sister, right? <laughs> Take the letters in her name and mix them up a little. Now stop and pick one letter. Don't say it. You're thinking the letter N? There is, a, there is an N in the word though, right? Yeah. Now it's getting either N or a D. Is it Denise? That's good. Okay, we're doing really well. All right, so now, and you never met me before today, right? Good. On the count of three, we're going to reveal the drawings come a little closer. It's a great photo opportunity. On the count of three, one, we're going to, you're going to turn these around on three. All right? One, two, three. Here. 
I get these in on your fly from California, you gotta bring some reading material. So I got two, this, is, this just got my attention right away. The, the new issue of Esquire, with this guy who's named Jason, Jason Momoa. Anyone ever heard of him? Really? I never heard of him. Anyway, he has two dogs, seven airstreams, and a climbing wall, but not yet this cat. Not yet. I mean, okay. The thing I like about magazines, like I bought, is because they are loaded with pictures. Okay? Images. And when you're a mind reader, pictures are so much stronger than, than uh, words. I mean, you can use words, but if you have a magazine full of images like this, chances are you're going to land on one sooner or later, usually sooner. So this is the new Esquire. And then I also have, I should have brought a bigger table, but I didn't. I have the, the National Geographic issue on women. Have you seen this yet? Really very good. Uh, again, National Geographic, their thing is photographs. There's a lot of photographs in here, a lot of different pictures. Uh, obviously, in this one, there's going to be a lot of women in here, so I'm going to have to be more specific with what I see. But I'm going to hold up these two magazines, and I'm going to just pick somebody. This lady in the white sweater, how are you? Oh, that's you, yeah. Is that gray? I'm not sure. Gray, white. And uh, your name is? Diane? That is correct, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Would you mind helping me with this experiment? Bring her up, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so, obviously, in a magazine like this, there are thousands of pictures. In a magazine like this, there are thousands of pictures all over the world, all over the planet. How are you if you stand right here? This is Diane and Diane, we have not planned a darn thing, have we? Okay, don't be nervous, this is really easy. So, I want to just eliminate one of these. Which one would you want to look at if you were on an airplane? All right, go ahead and take that, hold on to it. Here's what's going to happen. Stay. We get things to stay on this thing. Ooh, stage lights. Okay, what I'm going to do, are you right or left hand? Okay, so what you're going to do is you're, you're going to start with your left hand. Because the left hand is traditionally the more psychic. <laughs> because it gets more blood from the heart. I heard, I heard this on Dr. Phil, so I know it's true. Okay, it has to be. So what you're going to do is you're going to take the magazine. You are going to hold it in your left hand like this. And then with your right fingers, you're going to make, make a little thing like that so you can ripple through the pages here, all right, with your, with your right fingers. There you go. And then wherever you want to stop, you are going to stop, and you're going to open up the magazine, and you're going to look at the picture that's on the right, whatever it may be. And you're going to close the magazine, and you're done for that part, okay? So, random image. Hold your fingers on the edge, about like that. Don't do anything yet, because I'm going to say now, I'm going to turn away. You can ripple it any way you want. Pictures on your right. Now, if you get a page that has a bunch of words on it, you may have to do it again, but hopefully we'll get a nice big picture, okay? One, two, three. Go ahead, ripple, look at the picture on the right, and close it up. Have you got it? Okay. Take this, put it over here. She now has a picture in her mind, am I right? And the fun thing about this is I could rip up the pages in the magazine, but I cannot rip up the image that's in her mind right now. It's solid. So here we go. Turn towards me this way a little bit. Your hands like this just for a second. Oh, yeah. Okay. I saw a lot of metal and glass. Yeah. Metal and glass and heavy. This is not something you want to get in front of. No, is it my heart, right? Were you looking at a picture of an automobile? Like a Range Rover or something like that? Yes? Give her a round of applause. And the theory of what I'm going to 
share with you today. And I love it. I love all magic. I grew up with magic. My grandfather was a magician. I've always loved it. But I've centered in on this kind of magic because people find it intriguing. They say, well, what if? What if this was real? What if this person could really do that? And this is why Susan and I look at mediums and we say, hey, if that person could really do that, he'd be the most dangerous person on the planet. What is wrong with people, okay? You can't talk to dead people. And I'm not going to try and talk to dead people. But I'm asking you a question, and the question is, when does psychic entertainment, like what I just showed you, when is it not entertaining anymore? Okay, so I'm going to give you some examples of how easy it is I'm going to come down amongst my flock, okay? I really feel that in this church environment. That this would be perfect for me three or four hundred years ago. Unfortunately, it probably would have burned me at the stake. So I'm just going to go through the crowd a little bit and, and see, see who I can sense out. Uh, you know, it's funny. This gentleman here. I was just talking about a Land Rover. You got money, don't you, sir? <laughs> money. Did you just buy a new Land Rover? A Range Rover, sorry. Land Rover, Range Rover, I knew it was one of those. I can't get the name, car names right all the time. Ah, oh, let's see who else. And don't try to block me. <laughs> you know, if you try to block me, I will embarrass you. No, I won't embarrass you. This lady right here, um, in a red sweater. Uh, I'm getting a little orange. I'm colorblind. Uh, couple of different things come in. Now again, you're going to say, where, where does this come from? My spirit guide, of course. <laughs> my spirit guide just sends it. Comes through the top of my head. Or I just see my body and I get Liverpool. What? Liverpool. Yeah. Oh, does it say that on there? But it doesn't say anything about teeth, does it? <laughs> it does? It does? Because I'm getting teeth, Liverpool, travel. You love to travel, don't you? Okay, so, there, so there's more travel for you in the future. Okay? In fact, I see, you, I, see you going, I see you going to a place that you've never been to before. <laughs> that usually doesn't get laughs, but I'm <laughs> Red 
Avatar. Red. Red. It's a heart. Correct. It's a nine of hearts. It is correct. It is a nine of hearts. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> So you can clearly see how uh, a quote-unquote entertainer can quickly slide into very private information. And it's not that difficult to do. Once you have a background in deception, which I fortunately have, <laughs> okay? I, 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 don't, I don't try to hide that fact. I have a book out. It is called Psychic Blues. And I highly recommend it. What I did is I decided to infiltrate the psychic, psychic world and learn as much as I could by scamming the scammers. So what I did is I joined in in America with some of the most unscrupulous, nefarious people you can imagine. And I wrote a bunch of notes. And as I did this for almost nine years, until I couldn't stand it anymore, then I sat down and I took my notes and I wrote from the notes. Now, this is a fantastic book, I truly love it, but now you can get it on audiobook. And the audiobook is the new expanded version. I'm not going to pitch it too hard, but let's just say when this came out, the publisher uh, edited about a third of the original manuscript. So when I read it and I narrated it on the audio tape, I put the whole book out. So it's expanded, has a lot more nuance. <laughs> more about what I would, they just wanted the dirt in this book. But what I did, people told me one of the things that they thought was a weakness was it didn't really talk about my life and what was going on with, with my marriage. And, uh, you know, all the things of alcoholism and man, it was a guilt trip, a major guilt trip to be pretending to be a psychic because I was basically playing both sides of the fence. And the psychics didn't like me, and the skeptics didn't like me either. So it was, it was a very interesting passage. That's why it's called Confessions of a Conflicted Medium. So that's all I'll say about that. I think you'll get a laugh out of it. The audio book is actually pretty funny. Dark humor, of course. So, so um, SP, let's go back to SP for a minute. You have a... A brother? Aaron? Yes. Aaron is his name? Um, and you're a runner too, right? Yes. Wow. So quiet you could hear a pin run. <laughs> Let, let's try something different. Let's, could you focus on your middle name? E at the end? Yes. J at the beginning? Jane? Thank you. <laughs> and your cat's name is Shadow. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so, again, I don't know if you have a tool of these unseen forces, but I do appreciate your applause. Um, first, there's somebody I'm picking up named Zane. Where is it? It's a Z name, like Zane, oh, way in the back. Zane, you have two children that you know of, right? <laughs> Am I right? Yes. I'm doing that with my mind. Who's ever found that is? <laughs> Don't be surprised if it's someone on the other side. <laughs> I get a name with a double M in it. Uh, Emma. Uh, Gemma. So that's, that's your daughter, right? And your son has a very classic name. It's like a flyer or a, uh, a movie star. Flynn? Is that correct? So that's his two sons. Really impressive. Anyway. <laughs> okay, I made my point. My point is, when it's, when it's entertaining, it's fun, everybody gets a laugh. But if I start talking about your murder or missing child, or that your grandmother's standing behind you and she wants you to know it was okay, that you didn't say goodbye to her or go to her funeral, that is not entertainment in my book. And yet, in America, and probably everywhere else that you look, there's this flood of TV shows 
shows and characters who we call them grief vampires. That's what they do. And to see them work, I don't want to make somebody cry if I want to. I can do it. But I don't understand why anyone would pay to see that, okay? On television or anywhere else. So that's what to me entertainment becomes a little bit flawed. And Susan and I try and do the best we can to show how these people work. And I think <coughs> since Susan did her whole thing before me, it should be, that's probably why you're not that surprised. Imagine if I had done what I just did before Susan came on, right? Now you know from listening to Susan, you know that all of that information that I gave out was taken from Facebook pages yesterday. It took about 10 minutes per person to, to find your name on the list of names. And, uh, and, and last night at the party, uh, uh, Sarah, Sarah, you weren't there last night, were you? Yeah. So that is because I picked out a bunch of names. And then last night, you're all wearing Hulk and big name tags. <laughs> I just have to play the game of whatever, what were you playing, bingo? See, I wasn't really playing bingo, I was playing bingo! <laughs> the person, match the name to the face, try and remember it, go home and memorize, or in my case, I hate to give this stuff away, but... <laughs> There's cards on each one of you that I <laughs> Okay? So what I did is I picked out some relevant things. Now one of the things that makes a psychic so, so believable, believe it or not, is if you're a little bit wrong, it makes a psychic seem more believable. Because if you're a magician or a trickster, or like the guy who we exposed, Thomas John, he didn't miss anything. And that drew my attention to him because he was reading straight from Facebook pages. So everything he said was dead on accurate. And uh, when you see that, my antenna goes up. Because if you're too, too uh, what's the word, too perfect, then it just can't, it can't be, okay? At least that's the way we think. If it's a little imperfect, we go, oh, well, he's vulnerable, gee, he's human, he's just like me. So, and that was one of the things that initially drew me to mentalism, is because you could screw up and it was okay. You, know, you say, oh, the, the vibes, the negative vibes are so strong in this room, or I mean, psychics have a hundred different excuses, you know, and uh, I've heard just about all of them, and they're very well versed at it, that go right into that routine, oh, I feel a negative vibration in the room, it's like, I can't work today, and I initially learned this from, from my dear friend, Uri Geller, <laughs> who, who I really appreciate as a performer, but he's, he's not, He's not playing the game straight. He's doing it to get people to believe that he's a real thing. Let's see if there's anything I forgot here. <laughs> there might be one or two. I know there's one I forgot. Um, oh, Vivian, Viv, Viv, Levy, you were born on a Monday. You didn't even know that, right? <laughs> Little bits like that. So you try to fill in stuff like that, and then they go home and look it up. Wow, how, how did, there's no way in the world the psychic could have known that. There is, because we willingly, and with great glee, put up all of our most in, in, intimate information, well maybe not all of it, up on social media. So in the old days, mediums had to work really hard to get information on people. They'd send someone into the town, a couple of days before we would sit around in the bar or go to the cemetery or look at the obituaries, gather information, and then the medium would come in town and they would seem to know things. Now, it's all right there. It takes five minutes to, to really take advantage of, of, a, of a person. So that's, that's kind of my premise is that I love it, okay? I love the artifice of it. I think I mentioned this on the TV, uh, the TV uh, shot I did for the project last night. Is as a magician, I appreciate the artifice of the tricks and the subterfuge and the misdirection. I really like that. But what I don't like 
is what it does to people and how it takes advantage of, of grieving people, of people who really should be going to a, a specialized therapist or getting somebody who they can really not have a hook come into them and reel them in. Because in my experience, once the hook goes in, the medium or the psychic will not let go of that person. They will, they will do everything they can to keep them in the, in the group. And then no, no two clients ever get to meet each other and say, well, he told me the same thing, or he, she said this, and that's what she said to you too. They keep everybody separated. But they go in and they use these techniques day in, day out, you know, seven days a week, year after year, without any, any sense of empathy at all that I know of. I mean, I, I have to remind you, I'm speaking from my experience. <laughs> there may be other people in this group who have different experience, but my experience is these are, and I learned a new word today, and I, 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 I never really liked the word sociopath, but that came the closest to it. But now I've heard about psycho, psycho, psychopathy. Psychopathy, so I'm gonna try and start using that because I think that's more, more, more true. Uh, they have no compunctions, and uh, I would like to say that probably in my experience, 95% of the people who are out there who are doing psychic things are complete charlatans, and they know it. And they're, they're just taking, taking their time, ripping everybody off. They may have a rationalization for it, but it's usually pretty flimsy. Now, the other 5%, okay, 2.5%, 2.5% are people who are deluded. You know, they really believe they have a power of some sort. They could be off their meds. They could be uh, sch mildly schizophrenic. Hey, schizophrenics hear voices, don't they? And they're not always violent. Sometimes they might hear a, they, they, they hear a spirit voice. So, you know, that's 2.5. The other 2.5 that you have remaining, in my experience, are very intuitive, compassionate human beings who are really trying to help somebody, their fellow human being. But when you balance 2.5 against 97.5, the odds are not good. So, buyer beware. That's, what, that's why my book is called Psychic Blues, because the blues is... I don't have a problem with people talking to each other. In fact, I, I highly encourage it. But nowadays, we've lost that ability, except for people like you, who, who we listen to each other. We offer our advice, we, we share things. But in most cases, like if I was in a supermarket and I went up to somebody and I started telling them, uh, you, have, you have an anniversary coming up and you know your daughter's name is just you would be like, security, get this guy out of here, he's crazy, okay? He belongs on a street corner somewhere, right? And we have him in LA, so I know. But, but the deal is, if I set up a little table, and I put a sign up that says, tarot, tarot reading, spiritual guidance, people will stand in line for up to two hours to talk to me. They don't even know who I am. I have no, no cred uh, accreditation in anything but they just are drawn to the mystery. So that's the blues part of all this is, I mean, I love mystery, I love magic, ghost stories, all this kind of stuff, but I don't know about you, but I'm tired of being lied to. <laughs> and you know where I come from in America, so you know what? <laughs> we are in the golden age of the con. That's what I like to think, and it's not a pretty sight because you know, we thought maybe in the, in the spiritualist era, when people were like the Fox sisters and the people who started rapping on tables and all that, we thought that was bad. Now we're in a post, well, I don't like the post-truth. I used to, for a while I was going around saying, we're in a post-truth era. And then I realized, no, it's always been a post-truth era. It's just been people who take advantage of what is true and what is false. Right now in the US, we don't know anything. We don't know what's fact, what is fiction. So, for us, these sort of pariahs on our emotions, and believe me, it's a very emotional 
thing to do to tell somebody you're talking to their missing child, you know? It's, it's a big business, it's a huge business. And we're just scratching the surface, like Susan said, you know, we cut the head off one, one of the hydras and three more come up. But you have to do something. I really, I can't, I can't just sit still and watch this happen. So, activism for me works. And we do these things, we get out in the street, we've gone out, we've got the police come and try and remove us. I grew up in the 60s, okay? Can't you tell by the pants? <laughs> I grew up in the 60s and I, I, I went through the whole Vietnam thing and I found out that when you get out on the street and you show up, you make a difference. Now, the, the brilliant thing that Susan does is she has a way with her Wikipedia group, uh, Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia, where you can participate, you don't even have to leave your house. You can make a huge difference by just signing on with her team and getting the word out. Now, Myself, Susan, Susan will get out on the street once in a while, and she's good at it. But activism is the only way we're gonna we're gonna show what what we really think. And it's a, it's a hard sell because skeptics they don't, they're, they're thinkers. They're not always doers. And I think one of the things that was really important was Susan. That's when I met Susan. Was, back when Randy was running TAM and we were going to all these conferences, and we just said, I am so tired of sitting there listening to people talk. <laughs> I really don't want to be here talking to you. I want to try and energize you to get off your butts and find a way. I don't care what it is. Whatever your, whatever your biggest beef is. Maybe you don't like uh, homeopathy. Maybe you don't like uh, uh, Bigfoot. Whatever it is, you know, there's an opportunity to get your opinion out there. And with grassroots groups like Susan and I have both been involved with, you get a little pocket of people and you go out and do these things and it really brings you closer together. You, you, you feel empowered. You feel good. Even if, if, you know, it's one head off the high blood, that's one less. And what, what we've been trying to do is, and it's always been my goal as a performer as well, is to get to the largest group of people possible. And that's why our next thing, and it's going to be a mother, <laughs> if we get this one out there, it's going to be the mother of all stings. And, uh, but we don't want to just toss it to, you know, uh, the James Randy or the, or the skeptic groups, because you guys already know better. We have to find a way to get to the biggest group, and that would be somebody who is a, you know, in America we have 2020, I'm sure you've heard of that. That's the kind of segment we need. Or we need an actual, you know, maybe a little mini documentary or something to show how these grief vampires work. Because to me it's blatant criminality of the worst kind. And when you see it, and you've lived with it, and you've watched these people, and you know how they are on the side, as soon as as soon as everybody's out of the room, they're like, somebody roll me a joint, get me a beer. The spiritual side disappears completely. If, if, you're, if, you can, if you've taken the time to ingratiate yourself with them and they trust you. Meaning, they're not, they're not even genuine. I mean, they're, they become real people. But they don't project that when the sitters are in the room. They're these elevated spiritual beings, you know, who don't drink and... Uh, don't go to the bathroom. Uh, oh, I'll work eight or nine hours, no problem, you know. They're greedy. They want to work as much as they can. So, <clears throat> how am I doing on time? Oh, till questions or till the end? Now, let's take questions now. So, I am willing to take some questions. Please don't ask me how I did those things <laughs> that I did, because because for me, it's, it's uh, the mystery has to remain intact for you to remember me. I learned a long time ago. If I tell you what I did, you won't remember it. But if I don't tell you, you'll, it'll bug you and it'll stick in there. And it'll... I will share one really quick one, though, that you can do the next time you're having a party and you want to show people how psychic you are. Uh, <coughs> come down in the crowd. 
since I have an extra five minutes, we'll try this out. Let's see. This lady right here. You never met yet, you have no, no idea who I am or what I'm doing, right? Okay. So, I want you to go ahead and think of your phone number. Okay? Don't forget the area code. You tried to change your mind, didn't you? No? <laughs> Would you mind coming up on the stage? And your name is? Alyssa. Stand right here over the trap door. <laughs> so Melissa, I'd like you to just go ahead and read in a loud, clear voice what I wrote on the pad. My telephone number. <laughs> Doing with our information is just only going to get worse. 
and it is an addiction. I admit, I fall prey to it myself. I'm, I'm going to leave here and go put my photos <laughs> up on Facebook. But it, 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 it appeals to our egos and it makes us feel like, again, we are special. Just like the flat earthers, they all get together because they feel they're different. So it's, it's a magical thinking thing where they've convinced us that putting our information out there and finding other people this way is some sort of, I don't know, uh, I can't even think of the word. It started out as a great idea, but now I think it's dangerous. So I would say don't even start because it's all, probably already too late for all of us who have been on for more than five years, you know? Because everything we like is, is put into some sort of an algorithm, and it's just, I don't even want to think about it. But I would say privacy settings, yes, but just trying to avoid it and golfing or something else, you probably <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> yes? Um, would you say that the increasing cultural acceptance of pseudoscience and scientism would lead to a possible retardation of scientific advancement as a whole? There already is. You mean like slowing science down? Yeah, absolutely. But fear not, because again, I grew up in the 60s, there's a lot of this stuff around then too. And uh, so I don't, think, I don't think that it's a threat. Uh, as long as there's people who can get together in a room like this, you know. Once they start trying to disrupt thinking, like, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but, you know, I mean, in the 60s, there was a lot of whacked out thinking, too. And when you think about it, some things did change because of that thinking. So, I think it's just turning things around a little bit and making science interesting. In other words, this, all magic is science. And when we just did this thing in Las Vegas, we took some kids from a, a, a school and took them to SciCon. And we went, to, went into the school and we talked to them for a while. And they are hungry for this kind of information we're talking about. They just don't know where to get it from. So, and we took them to a science convention and they listened and we could see we planted like two or three dozen seeds that are gonna grow. So I think it's, Making information, scientific information, accessible and making it exciting. And it's like, there's so much crap on TV in America. It's like, the haunted this, the haunted that. This favorite ghost, favorite haunted. We need one. And there are a couple shows that are pretty good. One decent uh, critical thinking show. But, you know, like there's Adam Ruins, everything. How many people have seen that? Adam Ruins Everything is good, Brain Games is good. Uh, there are a smattering of people who are trying really hard, but it's still, the wave is not broken yet. But I really believe that it will change. And I, I don't have any fear that sooner or later kids are gonna wanna do science because they'll have to to stay alive. I hate to put it that way. <clears throat> good. So. Yes. I just had a question. Um, before social media was a thing, right. did these people just hot read in other ways, or they moved from cold reading to hot reading because it was easier? Well, cold reading has always been around, probably since caveman times. Uh, but hot reading, yeah, they had their methods, uh, and, and they were pretty amazing because society was a little bit more open, a little different. Um, I'll give you an example. There was a, a <coughs> very famous uh, mentalist named Dunninger. How many people ever hear of him? A couple. Dunninger was the mastermind reader, and he was kind of like Orson Welles, very commanding voice, very, you know, he paid attention to him when he spoke. And what he would do for his TV and radio show, since everyone, and, and this is a kind of an extension of what's going on today, everybody in his audience had a seat and bought a ticket. So everyone who bought a ticket in his audience, he had their name and address. So what he'd do is he would, for example, this is one I heard, he would send one of his assistants out to that person's house in that town. And they'd go to the door and knock on the door, and the person would open the door, and they'd say, hi, is this where Jim Smith lives? And the guy would say, there's no Jim Smith here. Oh, I'm really sorry, but 
just in that little bit of time, they looked into the person's house and say they saw a picture of a ship over the mantle. Guy makes a note, goes back during the show. Why do I see a picture of a ship over your mantle? There is no way the psychic could have known that. Oh, yes, there is. So they shared a lot of things like that. A lot of their old school, really old school techniques. So you just walk around somebody's house and you say, I see a lawnmower in your backyard you haven't used for many years. You know, it's like, and I've done that myself. I did a TV show where they sent me aerial views of people's houses. And it was pretty exciting because I could actually visualize. I took the person's hand and I said, let's walk forward. Uh, watch out for the palm tree and then we go around. <laughs> so not everything that's old is new if you, if, you, if you couch it that way. So back then they had some pretty, and they also used to share information. Uh, a medium would say, hey, hey, uh, Madam Ruby, I'm coming to Cincinnati tomorrow. Have you got some stuff for me? And she would say, oh, I'm coming back up to New York. Do you have some stuff for me? So he would bring his information on his sitters to her, and they'd trade. <clears throat> yes, sir. Yeah. Firstly, I'd love to know how you knew what was in my wife's mind, because I can never get it. <laughs> <laughs> psychic stuff. He's, he's, he's science and it's pretty much pure science and, and there is some critical thinking there. Uh, Carl Sagan's gone. You know? So, and that's what I think is a, a part of the issue in America right now is Randy is retired now and he was just this incredible showman. And he, would, he would do incredible things on Johnny Carson and all the things he did over the years and there's really nobody to fill his shoes now. So it's kind of sad because everybody's floundering. We need a leader. We need somebody who can lead like that. And it's very difficult to find a Carl Sagan or a uh, James Randi or a Martin Gardner or you know people like that are just you know we, we don't want to end up with some celebrity. You know that'd be the worst thing because nobody would pay any attention to it. So if you can think of somebody, let us know because because we're like. We're happening, but we're not happening like we did when uh, when Randy was, you know, really working really hard. So uh, there's hope. One last question. Do you think there's value in very lightly making fun of them? For example, New Zealand has got the television program Wellington Paranormal. I haven't seen it. It's, it's worth looking at it. It's, so, yeah, it's hard to describe. Yeah. <laughs> but it sort of makes fun of it, but in a quite a light way. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think humor is a great leveler. It's, it levels the playing field. As long as you're not poking fun at it, if you're really like nastily, you know, making fun, I don't like that because we, uh, Stephen Novella, are you in here in the audience still? No, he's long gone. We did a pilot for a TV show called The Skeptologist, and uh, just a terrible name, but we tried to pitch it, and we did the pilot, and, you know, it, it, was, it was good, but we made some mistakes. Like, we, we did this thing on wheatgrass, where we tried to show people that wheatgrass is just, you know, you might as well have a piece of lettuce. <laughs> and when we went into this guy's health food store, they had banjo music on in the background. And it was just like, no. You know, it didn't play well because people, it seemed like we were making fun of this guy's farm bringing up or whatever, you know. So I think you have to be really careful with that. But I think dark humor, like my book is dark humor. It's like, look, this is the way it is. It's crazier than any fiction you can imagine. Like some of the stories I heard when I was on a 900 psychic line, you could not write this stuff. It, it, and a, a writer couldn't write it, and I'd take these calls, and they would just, you know, so I wrote them, wrote them down. So that's humor, but you're not really laughing at the person, you're kind of laughing with them in a way, because they were, they were offering their information. So it's like, 
yeah, humor is a great way to get through to people, but how do you mix humor and science? That's somebody else's, you know, that's above my pay grade, but it'll happen, it'll happen. What was it called again? Science and Paranormal. Wait, don't wait, actually. It's a paradigm. Okay. So I hope I've given you all some things to think about. You've certainly given me some things to think about. And Susan and I will be around if we can give you any information or tell you anything more about what to do or how to do it. Please come and talk to us because we're, we're, all, we're all on the same, same level here, I think. So thank you so much for having me, okay? Thank you.